professor of enzyme technology, head of the protein uh, chemistry and enzyme technology section at Department of Biotechnology and Biomedicine, Technical University of Denmark. The section comprises eight professor research groups, in total 75 persons, including 20 PhD students. She is a group leader of enzyme technology in the section. Her research interests are many, among them applied enzyme technology, including enzyme enzymatic biorefining of biomass, agro-industrial side streams, starch, pectin, and seaweeds for production of bioactives and functional food compounds. Dr. May. getting connected here. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for this arrangement. Thanks a lot for inviting me to talk today. The last speaker. I'm, I'm very pleased to to be here and I'm grateful to both the Biotechnology Institute and Amano, of course. So I'm obviously from, from Denmark. As you can see, we have this little red flag. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk about the new food processes and, and ingredients with enzymes. So now we'll see how this works. So in general, I'd like to just to introduce one slide with what we actually do regarding enzyme technology as a research discipline. So we actually have uh, enzymes as a major disciplinary research area at the, at the university. And we generally treat, if you look at the bottom here, many different types of raw materials, very much like what we've heard today, both uh, residues and as you can see, maybe on the left, uh, seaweeds as well. That's one of my crazy PhD students showing his misery, how large his uh, seaweeds are. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. Then we're having some processing residues in our part of the world. It's, for example, uh, sugar beet. And recently we're even you know, working on uh, CO2 conversion as a carbon substrate and even plastics, as you can see at the bottom here. Then our work line is that we do some kind of bioinformatics to actually find various enzymes, discover new enzymes, or understand the diversity of the enzymology, maybe try the first homology structure. Then we very often produce the enzymes ourselves. We purchase a synthetic uh, gene. And then we do uh, kinetics, which is the middle part, the lower part, which is actually my main uh, research area. And then we very often do engineering, pretty much as what has been told today. And then we finally validate with the analytics and very often have another uh, structural go at it, even with uh, an ordinary structure, or at least an alpha fold with some docking, as I'll talk about. And then this, this continues forever, so we, gain new knowledge about these enzymes, how they work. Then we get uh, new ideas, uh, getting new conversion uh, concepts on board, very much in uh, contact with industry. I come from a very small country, so we're pretty much, how can I say, connected, not so much to the uh, enzyme industry only, but certainly to a lot of uh, processors in Europe. So I've decided to you know, consider some of the major challenges confronting the modern uh, food science uh, field today, as we've heard amply already. And I'm gonna pick uh, four examples where we have some results that are in line with uh, the title of the talk and I think the whole uh, vibe today that we need to do some sustainable processes. We need to work, you know, to solve some uh, large challenges, but at the same time, it has, there has to be some kind of a, a business model. Um, so the first is a little bit about uh, corn bran. Then I'm gonna talk about enzymatic synthesis of human milk oligosaccharides. I'm gonna introduce those. Enzymatic seaweed biorefining as a quite new field we are tackling. And then uh, since I, 
I uh, know this is a kind of functionality interest here. We have a little bit about a functional starch modification. That's a new field for me, but we have a little bit on that. So one of the first things, as we've also talked about, that's like using the byproducts. So obviously, uh, corn bran is a huge uh, side stream from uh, corn starch processing here in the, in the US. Uh, I believe, or we have tried to calculate that it's about 55 to 60 million tons per year. Currently a low value uh, byproduct. It's very uh, resistant to normal uh, enzymatic degradation of the backbone because you can see as I've uh, tried to draw here, a little bit exaggerated structural model with the cross-linking, but the problem is it's very, very uh, substituted. The Arabinus Island constitutes 20 to 40 percent. We know that solubilized Arabinus Islands, they can also be from other types of, of cereal, of course. Uh, they are particularly substituted when it comes to corn bran, so that's the corn bran Arabinus Island is, is usually insoluble because of the cross links. But you know, we're interested in seeing if we could uh, solubilize and get some of these, uh, you know, potentially healthy effects out of it. And I'd like to say now that enzymatic solubilization with classical endoacting endosilinases that are amply available commercially and that are used commercially in, in wheat uh, processing, for example, and in bread making, they, they don't work on this corn bran. So we decided to uh, look for one and we looked into corn uh, pathogens and did uh, bioinformatics. We've detailed that in, in a couple of papers here and found uh, an enzyme called, uh, that we call GH30. That's a different type of, of enzyme family and it comes from a, a bacterium called uh, Dicaea chrysanthemi, uh, which was formerly uh, called uh, something else. It's, <laughs> it attacks uh, it attacks other other uh, plant crops as well. So the idea here is not to completely chop the silent down to monomeric constituents, but try to dissolve some oligomeric uh, components without being too sens sensitive to the enzymatic uh, treatment time and dose. And we actually see that we can release some oligomers that, of course, over time, they do decrease a little bit, but it's not like the usual thing which happens with endo-acting enzymes where you get the oligomers into solution and then they are chopped up very, very quickly. Here we kind of retain the oligomeric uh, structures and the first thing uh, we looked at, that is, so, so what is this enzyme doing? Well, to the very uh, right, you will see a green circle, and it does actually chop quite close to a, uh, a methylated glucuronic acid, the, the type that uh, Emma Master talked about earlier, so I can offer you some here, Emma. Uh, and then we're able to cross-link it again by a lacase, so we can actually functionalize this material which is partly cross-linked still, but we can, we can use it as a new type of, of hydrogel in, in foods, for example. Um, the chemistry I've shown to the right, that is that we actually do show that the uh, ferulic acid does decrease and the diferrolates uh, increase. So we know when we add the lacase, two different types, they'll uh, act a little bit uh, slightly differently. Um, then we get the, the cross-links. In general, we are then very, very interested in these ferulic acid uh, crosslinks that in many ways hinder further processing of the original uh, corn brand. So we decided to look a little bit at these and I can reveal that maybe for the last 10 years we've been looking at if there were enzymes that would actually release these uh, diferrolates by by actually then cleaving near the, uh, at the ester bond, just like normal uh, ferulic acid esterases do, but then actually then open up the crosslinks, as we would call it. And uh, recently I've had a very, very good uh, PhD student or PhD fellow who worked on this and he used the, 
the solubilized uh, GH30 uh, oligomers to test if we could actually find uh, diphyrolic acid releasing enzymes in, uh, by testing a range of various uh, ferulic acid esterases. And at first, I'd like to say we did spend uh, quite some time developing a robust uh, LCMS analysis to actually detect these uh, diphyrolates. And yes, indeed, some fungal and a few bacterial, two bacterial we found, they're actually able to catalyze this uh, diphyrolic acid release, but mainly from the solubilized oligomers. So that's also interesting. That's probably, you know, how it works, that you need to get these uh, diphyrolates in uh, solution, so to speak. So we do actually infer that what we do release with this GA30, that small, you know, sandwich uh, compounds of uh, cross-linked uh, complex, uh, uh, complexly substituted uh, ferulate. Then we, we've tried to, and I can say at this time of the day, we've tried to understand, so what is the structure function? Why do they why do they, why do some release these DFAS? And uh, I tried to dock it, we've tried to do some docking experiments, but to be perfectly honest, we're not 100% sure of why some uh, of the uh, fungal ferulal esterases can do it and others cannot. There might be some loop and lid uh, function that I've shown to the right, but we're currently pursuing that further. So the scientific part is, of course, to understand how the enzymes exactly do this. They will all release the ferulic acid as well, but only some will, will actually attack these uh, tight uh, DFAS structures. Then the question is, can we, can we, actually, can we actually confirm that once the ferulic acid uh, diferulates are present in a cross-linked fashion. Is that, is that good in the gut, even if they are uh, solubilized? We know that when they are insoluble, they, they, are, they, are, not, uh, they are not prebiotic at least. So we did uh, very recently, this is just an in vitro fermentation over 24 hours, although with a genuine uh, human feces. Uh, so these, uh, these uh, results have to be taken with a, with a pinch of salt. But, you know, we did then treat the uh, original oligomers with uh, alkaline. So you'll move the, the diferulates, and then we also cross-linked it again with lactase. So we got an exaggerated cross-linking, and then we, we tested how, how that affected the 24-hour uh, fermentation in vitro. And used inulin as a control, as I hope you can see. And we did see some uh, significant uh, changes. Of course, uh, this is only a small fraction that I have time to show. Uh, these results are sometimes extremely complicated to actually interpret objectively. But we did see that certain bifidobacteria and blautia, they did increase in the relative abundance. We even uh, could, could nail those down to uh, Prevotella copri and, and something called Anerostipus hadrus. I don't know if you can see that at the bottom. And then we had the actual abundance and did a number of other uh, assessments of the, of the microbiology. But what we do believe is that actually these oligomers that have some degree of cross-linking, they do work because they are in fact soluble. But if we if we cross-link too much, they become insoluble, and that somehow does not improve their immediate uh, prebiotic activity. But on the other hand, when we remove the, the diferulates, they have lesser, at least this uh, beneficial bacterial growth-promoting activity. So there's more to be done in this field, but I feel this could be uh, good news for you know, urbinocylin and use of this uh, material for a value-added uh, proposition. Next subject, enzymatic uh, synthesis of human milk oligosaccharides. Human milk oligosaccharides, I think you may know that that's quite an abundant uh, constituent of human, uh, human breast milk. 
it has many beneficial effects for the breastfed uh, baby. And there is now a big impetus for actually biosynthetic production, not to avoid breastfeeding, but to actually improve the infant uh, formula that are even you know, sold after the baby has been breastfed. We also know now that some of these, they even have a be beneficial effect in, in adults and in the, in the elderly. So we have embarked on this uh, for, for a while now. And the interesting thing is there's a lot of different structures built on a basic uh, blueprint uh, structure with only five uh, monomers that I've tried to sketch here, uh, mainly uh, lactose in the reducing end, and then decorations or elongations with uh, NS2 glucosamine, galactose, and then uh, decorations with fucose and, and sialic acid. So we have all these uh, as our playground for, for synthesis, and we're actually trying to now enhance the number of, of different types very recently, and it happens to be right in our backyard in, in Denmark, actually, where they have started this uh, factory production in E. coli of these small, uh, the small, very few, three, four, uh, of particularly abundant, it's the two prime uh, fucosyl lactose, it's something called six prime sialyl lactose, which is uh, less prevalent at present, and then it's something called LNNT that has like this. And uh, the new idea is that we'll actually try to then decorate with the uh, sialyl or uh, fucosyl, as I'll, I'll show you. It's particularly difficult for E. coli to actually uh, produce and secrete the sialylate. So we have, uh, for a while, worked on the, we call it the non-virulent uh, twin or cousin from the original Trypanosoma crudsi, uh, producing, or the Trypanosoma crudsi sialidase, which is tied to the virulence of that uh, Trypanosoma disease. And we ended up, uh, you know, finding an original Argentinian paper where they had by five, six, uh, very few amino acid substitutions in the active site. He had changed the enzyme to be to work in, in the reverse, to transglycosylate uh, or transsialylate. And that's what we have been then expanding from there. One other point I'd like to emphasize that is to use another side stream from uh, dairy production. And it turns out we all know what happens when the cheese clots. But remember, there's also a glycoprotein released, and that glycoprotein from the kappa casein turns out to be uh, sialylated, and we have used that as a sialyl donor for this uh, transglycosylation uh, reaction. And uh, some of my colleagues here that uh, do this, they uh, are pictured here, uh, Birgitte and Jesper. And uh, the next is, of course, we have engineered this with something we call the loop engineering exactly to make the transglycosylation work better and to make a very, very long uh, story short, we're now up to having 15 mutations near the, near the active site and in the loops, uh, carefully developed from an analysis. And we now have something called now TR15 and TR16 with these uh, mutations that involve both those in the active site and some around the loop to actually see if we can direct that uh, sialyl uh, in, the, in the reverse reaction. So the next uh, application step is, of course, okay, does this work in milk? Instead of producing only the ingredients, could you do this in milk prior to the drying, prior to the infant formula uh, preparation, or even as a, as a type of active uh, beverage product? And then in, in Denmark, we have a system where you can become an industrial postdoc or an industrial PhD. And this is actually uh, Valentina. She looks like she, she just got out of uh, high school. Uh, she's the mother of, of two children and a very bright <laughs> young postdoc with me. And she worked on this project where she showed with these uh, newly developed uh, transsialyl uh, acting enzymes that you could do the exact same reaction in milk. You could be concerned that actually in milk there's both the uh, 
the, uh, the lipids and the proteins, but the reactions run uh, readily. And she was also forced to actually determine the activation energy. And she found that this uh, TR15 was actually far better, even uh, had a lower uh, activation energy than the original Tryponosoma cruzi uh, uh, silid, true trans silidase that you see at the, at the bottom here. But that uh, worked as well. Then she got a little bit more ambitious and asked if she could try to do simultaneous uh, silylation and fucosylation in the milk where the idea is to actually expand that palette of different types of uh, human milk oligosaccharides you would have. And you can easily do that now with some of the components available. We actually had to add that uh, uh, silylated gly uh, glycoprotein. It couldn't actually work well enough on the original kappa casein. But by adding these uh, commercial component, the, 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 the two prime fucosyl lactose, then you can use that as a donor onto the LNNT. We have another uh, uh, fucosidase that we have shown in a different uh, study. It's, it's called uh, TF uh, that I've uh, uh, pictured here to the upper right. That's from a bacterium called Tanarella uh, Fusinthia. It's one that actually causes oral disease, but the enzyme uh, is taken out of the organism and works well to transglycosylate without even being engineered. And that also works uh, perfectly well. It's not the highest yield uh, we have recorded, but we could actually produce some of these more uh, complex DSLNT in the milk and in the, in the buffer as well in one reaction. Then we got curious about if there was a system among these uh, glycosyl uh, hydrolase family 29, if we could predict this transglycosylation ability. There is a lot of hydrolytic data available in literature, and we have also done this a lot. It's easy enough to see which kind of uh, compound that is hydrolyzed. I've tried to map it here, it's a little bit small. We have done kind of a new bioinformatic analysis where we try to, to, to group these to understand how these work uh, better. And we have a bioinformatician, a Christian, who's pictured to the very right there, who's, uh, who's championing uh, uh, this. Then when we add the actual uh, uh, trans, uh, well, first there is a complex uh, substrate specificity. We don't really get anything from that. Then when we try to add the trans glycosylations, that's these uh, black spots that I hope you can see. The question is, is there a way or are there certain groups of these enzymes that actually trans glycosylate better? And the answer is uh, no. We, we're not able to, to identify these uh, groupings according to the sequence and structure. So we have to conclude that actually this trans glycosylation ability, which is quite interesting from a biological point of view, it seems to be broadly uh, distributed across this uh, family and we cannot predict this at all from the, from the motive uh, sequences that we use uh, like this. Then I'm gonna run very quickly through some of the brown uh, seaweeds. Brown seaweeds, the kelp type, they are now actually grown even in the North Atlantic now because the hydrocolloid market seems uh, endless. Alginate uh, you use as a you know, hydrocolloid. It used in, uh, as I'll show on the next slide. And we now have even bucoidin and, and laminarin that can also be used. We'll not eat the raw seaweed anymore in the Stone Age in, in Denmark. This was, this was eaten, but it's, it's not considered a good uh, palatable food source today. So we'll try to see, can we actually modify the alginate of some of this cultivated uh, seaweed, which doesn't necessarily have a good gelling alginate in itself. And you can do that by enhancing the uh, guluronic acid uh, components. And you can do that by removing the manuronic acid parts. And there's plenty of, of calcium there. So that's actually what we have done. We have... Uh, 
considered various strategies, but we have at first tried to see if we can simply remove some of the manuronic acid uh, uh, enzymatically. And here are some other guys uh, from my lab, uh, Bo and Casper, and they furthermore wanted to see if we could find, because of the novelty, if we could find these enzymes in, in fungi, which uh, they did. And uh, this is found in a particular group here that I have uh, circulated in green, and then they went ahead, as I've tried to sketch, because they also, they always think, you know, biotechnology and what can we do. So we produced uh, some of these uh, uh, enzymes in our lab where we have a, a Picia Pastoris uh, production facility, I can say, with a couple of uh, laptop uh, fermenters. Uh, and true enough, they did find in this um, Salina, P. Salina fungus, actually new types of alginate lyases that they have you know, characterized uh, up and down. And the original idea was to understand how this uh, uh, fungus actually adapted to grow on this brown seaweed. We thought there was a big kind of revelation in understanding that it would have a completely different set of, of casimes in order to, to thrive there. But uh, no, not at all. It turned out that it was only a small set of alginate uh, lyase alginate degrading enzymes that actually distinguished it from, from other uh, fungi. So that means that we could probably easily uh, find more. And, you know, just to, to show, then we found one that was a little bit faster on the poly-M, polymanuronic acid, and went ahead and, and uh, you know, considered that. And it can actually uh, modify alginate, so you get a more uh, poly gluronic acid uh, uh, content. Then another one is he discovered, uh, Bo discovered a new exo polysaccharide lyase family eight, the first fungal in that uh, family that can do the same. It selectively uh, removes uh, manuronic acid and maybe that has a little bit a better uh, prospect for modifying the, the, the alginate. We're currently understand, trying to understand if we can use these uh, products uh, for something, and we also want to understand how this uh, enzyme functions. He had to move on to another project, uh, so we're currently you know, struggling a little bit to continue this uh, type of work. Then I can see for the sake of time, I'll only spend a few minutes on some of our favorite enzymes, that's the Fucoidin, modifying enzymes. We started out by looking at the Fucoidin, which is a very highly valued bioactive polysaccharide in brown seaweeds. And again, very similar to what uh, Pam Ismail explained, we're trying to extract using enzymes in order to get the structures out intact. They come as, as uh, sulfated compounds. They have uh, interesting backbones, very rich in glucose, of course, that's why it's called Fucoidin. Then they have alternating 1,3,1,4, alpha-1,4,1,3 bonds, and various patterns of the sulfate uh, substitutions. And we, we know that they have a range of biological activities that appear tied to the, to the sulfation pattern and, of course, the backbone pattern that we don't quite understand yet. Then we, we want to make sure that the, the fucoidins can be used and that's very important to get some kind of homogeneous products because the Fucoidin does change depending on the origin and of course depending on the type of extraction where you can destroy it uh, pretty well. So we have a large program where we discover these enzymes that, uh, you know, keep giving, as, as we say. <laughs> there's, a new, there's a new family as well. They're organized roughly in, in two families, some that mainly Hydro catalyze the hydrolysis of the alpha-1,4 bond in the backbone, that's uh, the GH107, then some that generally mainly catalyze the uh, alpha-1,3 in the backbone, that's GH168. Of course, uh, we have then managed to find some that don't uh, fit into this pattern. There are very few, so it's easy enough to, 
to do this by alignment, finding other GH107, but some we have found they even, they even cleave the alpha-1,3. Then another, th another problem, these enzymes, they would usually come, strangely enough, from marine-derived uh, microbes, and they're very, very unstable when we try to express them in E. coli, as in you cannot even do the Western blot before it's been decayed. And then uh, Maria, to the right here at the bottom, she decided to, to actually chop them up and remove these uh, uh, C-terminal parts that are actually called LAMG uh, constructs that are kind of the arms on which the enzyme is tied when, it, when it's tied to the microbe. And then we get these uh, severely C-terminally truncated uh, enzymes that work extremely well. They also express well, and they chop down the cucoidin extremely well. And we have written uh, uh, quite some articles about that because that's a very interesting trick to actually stabilize uh, these enzymes. We are now aware that apart from first we spent uh, more than a year trying to remove the, the sulfate groups. We thought they were in the way, but it turns out that, that they are actually not in the way. Some of these substitutions on the fucoidin that vary in different seaweeds, and we're particularly interested in something called Sagrina latissima, which is grown in the cold uh, northern hemisphere, that they actually use these substitutions as kind of recognition tags for the, for the enzymes. We're not quite quite clear about how, how that uh, works yet, but we are we're finding constantly new types of oligomers that we then uh, test with medical doctors that we have a collaboration with in, in Germany, that they have all kinds of strange biomedical functions. And, and that's why I, I, I'd like to just, uh, in the interest, I know the uh, Amano is also interested in the uh, kind of pharmaceutical era, so here's an area, it's completely uh, f free. This is not tied to production or anything that we get the enzymes from any companies. Some of these Fucoidan products, exactly as explains, they're of course more worth than the enzymes themselves, but they work uh, in, in various biomedical fashions. And one of the most uh, interesting that is they have some kind of bone healing function. We have uh, worked with people who actually break the bones in these uh, sheep then stitch them together <laughs> with some of this uh, fucoidin as well. Another type of, of the structure, and exactly those that we have enzymatically extracted, they'll, they'll help work on, on uh, the eye disease, it seems, or at least the processes that lead to this uh, AMD, which is called the age-related macular uh, degeneration, which is actually increasing all over the world, including in, in this uh, country. And there's no cure except if you want to go to your doctor and have an injection directly into the eye uh, once a month. Then just briefly, I can see I'm a little bit over time, but um, I have three slides about the functional starch modification because there's a very interesting aspect that I added when I heard <laughs> some of the lectures today that actually the potato starch industry, quite big in Europe, they're also looking for clean label products. Most of the potato starch is used in foods in everything from uh, gummy bears to mayonnaise and dressings and artificial cheese. But they use chemical modification. So now their vision is to use enzymatic modification. One of the first things we have looked at, that's the uh, alpha glucanotransferases, the same type that do the cyclodextrins that the previous speaker talked about, but here, We've, we have located some that actually elongate the chains. As you can see, I have uh, drawn here in this uh, pitiful uh, sketch. But we actually decided to look into this. They are intracellular enzymes. They don't add new chains, they elongate uh, chains. And to make a very long uh, story short about they have different uh, modular uh, makeups, they are distributed across a wide range of different types of bacterial uh, species. There is some uh, which is uh, patented by Abebe in Holland from a thermos uh, thermophilus, which is highly thermostable. We don't necessarily need a highly thermostable enzyme here, but we use that as our uh, benchmark. It's the one called uh, TT in the around five o'clock. Um, 
And then we test it, and that's just how we normally do it. We test their optima in a special uh, statistical uh, setup, and we decide, define the optima, and as you can see, true enough, the upper right TT has a very high thermal, uh, thermal stability, whereas the others, they have a pH temperature optimum, you know, medium range. Then we have a new uh, technique where we actually measure the chain elongation, including the chain elongation change. And uh, as you can maybe see, you know, they all, when we go from the yellow to the more purple, they pick up or remove the shorter that become uh, slightly longer. But the patterns are relatively similar. We had hoped to find some that stood out and we're still uh, looking a little bit at that, the main uh, difference is now in their activity. And, and we don't completely, we simply don't completely understand uh, why we know that this, uh, the TT that I have encircled here, which is the second to the right on the upper left uh, diagram, has a more condensed structure, but a more open crevice as its active site. It's much, much better at generating the type of chain uh, structure, if you want, in the starch that forms these uh, gels at very, very low enzyme dosage. So we're working on, on this still. It's, it's very, very interesting that an enzymatic treatment will cause the starch to, to gel. So, you know, applied uh, enzyme technology research has a broad impact, uh, as you all know. And uh, we, we have both discovered new enzymes. We've done a bit of new protein engineering and at the same time created some new scientific uh, insight, which is never uh, complete, but at least we're, we're working on it. And we're having new processes, even new uh, molecular products, including these fucoidans and human milk uh, oligos for sure. And then we also have a little bit of better bioresource utilization by using, for example, the, the corn bran uh, erbinocylin. And I'd like to address especially to the, to the Protein Innovation Center here. We've also recently embarked on something called biocatalytic protein mobilization of plant foods. That's, of course, to remove the things around the protein so they can, so they can become a little bit more accessible. And that's also on peas. Uh, exactly the type of peas uh, which was shown, and we call it give uh, peas a chance uh, in, the, in the project. And we are just, we have just initiated this, but I'd be very pleased to, you know, collaborate more on this. So that's all for today. This is the, the sponsors, Innovation Fund uh, Denmark. They're the ones in Denmark that actually support our uh, industry university research. We, of course, uh, get uh, significant uh, funding from the Novo Nordisk Foundation. We've also been lucky to have some uh, Chinese uh, scholarship PhD students, as well as the European and something called the KMC, that's the Danish Potato uh, Factory Union. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm thinking about the uh, arabinoxylan, your first project, and the, di the ferulic acid dimers. Uh, you, sh you said, um, if I understood well, you can remove these with alkali treatment, uh, but then there is some reduced bioactivity. Have you thought about controlling, but then too much is also a problem. <laughs> so controlling the cross-linking through lacase dehydrogenase coupling system. Uh, my understanding is the free radical can be used as an electron acceptor yeah. for the dehydrogenases. Thanks for the question. Well, that's what we thought we did. <laughs> but uh, those of you, like you, you have been to my office, so before we embarked on this experiment, we did try to envisage, you know, up and down the wall. So what will happen because we believe the solubility has a significant effect. 
in this type of test that we did, that's, ju that's just a mere kind of potential prebiotic if they can support the growth of some beneficial organisms, uh, especially the bifidobacteria, that we will know that that would be, you know, overall considered as a, as a step in the right uh, direction at least. It's not, you know, a good enough experiment to just do a batch fermentation over 24 hours. But once you begin to cross-link more than what we have just released, they become insoluble and they actually form these gels. And somehow, I think it's merely that physical uh, insolubility that does reduce uh, the access of the enzymes from the microbes. We've seen uh, some of the supporting results in this. We, of course, have the original equivalent kind of insoluble material and these uh, diferulic acid releasing enzymes, they, they just don't work as well on that. So, so I think there's something there related to the uh, solubility and we simply cannot distinguish uh, if there is an effect of the type of uh, diferulic acid. We, we cannot control that with lactase. It just polymerizes. I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, you showed a phylogenetic tree of the uh, trans glycosylation enzymes and said you couldn't predict which ones would have that activity. Was that based on primary amino acid sequence and have you tried yes. alpha fold and yes, looking at three dimensional or, or, or sorry, tertiary well, or secondary structure? Thanks for the question. Um, We did select uh, a range of enzymes around that first kind of, uh, it's actually a dendrogram built on the alignment. It's not a phylogenetic uh, tree as such. And then of course, because the assay to assess the transglycosylation is, it's certainly not a high throughput. <laughs> so we first decided to say, okay, what's the hydrolytic capability? And then we use that same series of enzymes for the, for the trans uh, glycosylation. And the technique we use for the bioinformatics, it's not that full uh, chain alignment. It's an amino acid kind of signature uh, comparison method where we have eight amino acids in a row and then kind of in silico chop up the, the protein to see if these patterns of small uh, signatures, as we call them, if there is some kind of explanation. We've seen in, in other instances that the, that the resolution that you get by this in carbohydrate processing enzymes does give, you know, a functional annotation better than the uh, KC family uh, will do because within each fold, there can be plenty of, you know, different uh, functionalities just as there is. But unfortunately, at first we didn't see any, you know, congruence between any kind of pattern. We saw this trend glycosylation as spread. So, but we would normally do that, yes. Fold it up, maybe even dock it, maybe even get the structure, yeah. Thank you, I have a question. First, thank you for your presentation. Very nice, impressive work. Um, I have a question related to the um, synthesis of the human oligosaccharides. To the so, uh, say it again, please. The synth synthesis yeah. of the oligo, uh, human oligo, uh, yeah. human milk oligosaccharides. So, um, is there any um, regulatory uh, prohibition? Uh, what What about labeling and such? Great question. Fortunately, we, we collaborate with the, the industry here, actually one particular company, and even though these are exact structure identical components, but there's a particularly large uh, country east of here, far east, begins with a C, where this is not allowed. But they are having some tricks where they kind of evolve <laughs> the bacteria to produce 
these enzymes and produce these uh, components. Uh, but right now, our work here is for in vitro work, and it's, it's then for other markets, but where, where the regulatory uh, access is, is easier, several places in Europe, for example. Yeah. Very good, thank you. So I have the honor uh, to do the closing remarks and share the closing remarks with 